So that creation of uh, AI systems that have eyes and ears and that can uh, see and understand and listen and understand and create smart AI based on data that used to be transient, but now it can create a lot of value. Imagine autonomous store, autonomous fast food, uh, autonomous uh, schools, uh, uh, autonomously watching elderly people not to fall down. These are all possible applications, a huge way. Uh, and that requires putting sensors. Uh, cameras may be sensitive to some people, then you can have heat sensors or motion sensors, 3D sensors. So sensors that get the job done that understands what's happening in the environment and, for example, providing security when your offices are empty. And the fourth wave is adding not eyes and ears, but arms and legs to the AI so that they can walk around and manipulate. Now all of a sudden they can do the job of someone on assembly line. Uh, robots can create, can first inspect and then create and make and assemble objects. And commercial robots uh, can also do a lot of things like dishwashing, uh, cooking hamburgers. We've seen those stores start to come out. And of course, autonomous vehicle will replace all of our driving in the next 20 or 30 years. In fact, one day we won't be allowed to drive on the road because we're going to be a hazard to ourselves. So these four waves, each taking maybe 10 years to mature, uh, each will create on the order of 5 to 10% to our GDP. Each will displace 5 or 10% of workers in various domains. And each will add a lot of value, a lot of profit. So this is all dividend and great things from AI. So, I promise to talk about China. You're probably thinking U.S. is so far ahead, based on Greg's talk. U.S. invented everything, all the Turing Award recipients, deep learning, all American. So why is there any chance for China? On top of that, U.S. has dominated the tech scene from PC to internet to smartphone to social. So why would the Chinese have a chance at all? A miracle happened about 10 years ago. This following loop became operational. And this loop is the combination of China, such a large market, three times larger than US in mobile. Therefore, it attracts a lot of capital to invest in it. And some of the investors in the capital are very smart and they guide the entrepreneurs who are tenacious and hardworking. Uh, they work 996, 997, that means 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days or seven days a week and they build great products, and those products get even more users and make more money, and the loop continues. And in 10 years, we've gone from early days of copying from the US. People call by do the Google of China, uh, Sina the Yahoo of China, uh, because they were pretty much US ideas brought over to China. But in the green zone, you see the Chinese companies start to localize features and build new products that sometimes are better than US products. For example, even in the green zone five years ago, WeChat is a better product than Facebook Messenger. Weibo is a better product than Twitter. Try it if you don't believe me. And then the right hand, orange side, actually led to a number of companies just in the last two years. All of these companies started in the last two years. This is, this is not AI company. These are just consumer uh, internet companies. These eight, I won't have time to go into any of them, but just so that you know, they are no longer uh, the XYZ of China, uh, that where XYZ is an American company. All eight companies have original innovation. In fact, a number of people are copying them to US, Southeast Asia, and other countries. So, and these companies are not small. You can see their market value, market value valuation are 75 billion to 200 billion. And so these giant technology innovators have emerged and in, in creating these amazing companies, the Chinese entrepreneurs have become hardened. They're tenacious, they fight hard. Unlike US where the competition is very gentlemanly, right? <laughs> uh, Instagram would say, oh, you're, that's Pinterest's job, we'll work together. Pinterest would say, oh, that's Instagram's job, we don't, we don't get into each other's space. In China, uh, very quickly, there, there will be a Instagram. <laughs> which would be one by whichever is tenacious, stronger, has better strategy. I have so much I can tell you in stories here, 
but we're limited in time. But these, uh, but I'll just tell you, if we, if Mars suddenly became available for companies to move there, and a top Silicon Valley entrepreneur moves there, top Chinese entrepreneur moves there, I'm afraid the outcome is likely that a Chinese entrepreneur will win the market share at Mars. Uh, China has a lot of capital. 48% of the world's AI money goes into China, 38% to US. China has a lot of unicorns. On the right, you see four of the five unicorns we've created. Think about this. Sinovation Ventures as one fund, just us, alone, in the last two years, we have created five unicorns, totaling $23 billion in valuation. And I don't even know if there are that many unicorns in the US altogether in AI. These are not any unicorn. These are all AI unicorns. And also, we are moving from an early adopter stage of AI to a widespread adoption. And that's an advantage for China. Because US has a lot of brilliant researchers. So if every startup needs a researcher, well, US can make a lot more of those. The researchers are not as top tier in China. But the people in China, they work hard to get the job done. So in a application stage, it's actually advantage China. That's reason four. And the fifth reason is probably the biggest reason. China has so much data, three times as many users, uh, 10 times as much food takeout, 50 times as much mobile payment. I don't carry cash in China anymore. And 300 times in shared bicycle ride. All of this generates data, and more data makes AI work better. Finally, a lot of people say, well, it, it doesn't the Chinese government help? Absolutely. Uh, but not in terms of giving money, but in terms of having a techno-utilitarian policy. That means uh, the Chinese government loves to launch new technologies. They'll let them launch and see how it goes. There are problems, they get regulated. No problems, head start, learning along the way. More data and gets better. Take as an example, truck testing on autonomous, autonomous truck testing on highways. In the US, the truckers union managed to slow down the testing uh, because it would impact their jobs. In China, highways are being built with sensors to increase the safety and earlier deployment of autonomous trucks. So US is ahead in this technology, but policy may be dragging US feet back to give China a chance to lead. So if we were to evaluate China versus US, I think today US is a little bit ahead. Uh, if we look at the four waves, um, but if we look at five years from now, China is likely to catch up. So a lot of things that I skipped is in this book, AI Superpowers. Hope you all get a copy. Uh, I'll be signing for this book in a later session. Uh, so come and get me. But the key point I'm trying to make here is that for once, we now have a dual engine driving the progress of AI. Whereas for PC, mobile, social, uh, mostly U it was US uh, brain power driving this revolution. Now China and US are two engines driving it forward, so it's arguably going to even happen faster. But despite all the talks about competition, AI is really not a um, nuclear weapon. Far from it. AI is electricity. It enables all. And obviously people can do uh, things with it that relates to weapons, but the great majority of the applications, like any other technology, are going to be productive and useful. And most Chinese, uh, most uh, AI people are very much natural, open, and sharing. Greg was a good example. When I started in grad school, uh, we shared all the data and the source code with other universities, and that continues to happen. So I'd like to think we're the kind of people that can uh, avoid going into these cold metaf cold war metaphors and really try to figure out ways to work together to reap this 16 trillion dollars of opportunity according to PwC by the year 2030 from all the value that AI will create. To be sure, AI will create a lot of problems, uh, go from privacy, security, giants, dominance, monopoly, and my most worrisome one is jobs, job displacement. Because AI will do a lot of routine work, and that's beginning to happen already, whether in blue collar or white collar, you see headlines about jobs being displaced by smart AI. And the answer is not that simple of all jobs are gone or all jobs are enhanced. If we look at what AI is not good at, there are two things. One is creativity on the x-axis, one is 
compassion, empathy. And actually, there's a different answer of human AI coexistence. It depends on which quadrant we look at. For the low compassion, low, optimism, uh, low creativity, AI will take all the jobs. For the ones that are highly creative but not very social, uh, people will continue to do the job, but AI can provide the tool, such as a filter for someone who's inventing a new drug. And for some jobs where AI is really good at analytics because it doesn't require creativity, but we want a human interface, like a doctor or a teacher, then the two will collaborate. This will be a symbiotic combination where AI will bring down the cost of healthcare, accuracy of healthcare, but we want the human warmth to wrap around it because people don't want to be treated by a cold machine. And finally, when it's high compassion and high creativity, humans will shine and continue to use AI as value. So this is not a simple issue, and I think what's going to need it is that all of us bring to bear all the ideas um, that from all over the world to see how we can solve the problems. I think near term, we do have a lot of problems, the security, privacy, jobs, but I think if we really look 50 years from now and then look back, we will really see AI as an era of enlightenment because if we think about it 50 years from now, we'll come back and see that AI will have liberated us from having to do routine work and really push us into thinking work isn't what makes us human, what is. And we also think that we'll begin to realize, uh, throw away the robot overlord I silly ideas and realize that we are humans, we have free will, and that we're the ones who are gonna write the, end, the ending to our AI story. Thank you. I think uh, Tim is going to come out and we're going to have a little dialogue. Right, Tim? Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I have to say I have had the great good fortune to have been able to read an advanced copy of AI Superpowers and I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, you've got a little bit of a taste of it, uh, but this is way more. And I, I think it's, it's super important for us here in the U.S. to have a deeper view of China than we do today. And I, I can't think of a better person to get it from and a better place than, than your book. So uh, I want to start with, uh, boy, there's so much I want to talk to you about. Let, let me kind of work backwards through your talk. And um, let's start with this AI as electricity and also these Chinese unicorns. Okay, so. We kind of know what electricity enabled. It gave us lighting, it gave us you know, all these home appliances, it gave us, you know, it changed the nature of our society. What are these specific unicorns, leaving aside their valuation, what are they actually doing mm. that is, is changing Chinese society? Right. Um, two of the unicorns are building semiconductor for AI acceleration. One is a very low cost acceleration that would make AI to be able to go into toys. Another one is building a very uh, cost-effective uh, inferencing engine that can, can be used by large companies in a large data structure. Their technology also works for uh, uh, Bitcoin's mining, mm -hmm. so a lot of profit and valuation comes from that. A third company builds a computer vision technology that can do face and object recognition mm -hmm. and is applied to uh, corporate, uh, that's how I get to work every day. My face opens the door. Uh, it has applications in education, uh, smart city, security, and many others. A fourth company is a banking financial AI company. Mm -hmm. They build AI to help banks make money um, and save money. Yeah. The last one is an autonomous vehicle company yeah. that has L3 fully working, perhaps best in the industry and now gets, is doing L4 based on a very robust L3. Yeah, I feel like your point about uh, Chinese willingness to build infrastructure that will actually help along the vehicles rather than you know, the vehicles have to somehow fit into our existing society is a, is a big edge for China. Uh, how do you, do you see that in other areas as well? Well, uh, the city of Xi'an is the size of Chicago being built for autonomous driving. Uh, the city of Suzhou is taking a 10 kilometer space and making a two level um, uh, driving, one level for autonomous, one level for non-autonomous. 
So all the cities are being innovative to try infrastructure play uh, and then get a lot of trials and tests and data feedback. Right, and, and that really indicates sort of a very different kind of partnership between government and companies in China that we have here. And this, that, that seems to be an advantage o over time. I think, I think it is. There's no reason U.S. or some other government can't do some of that. Yeah. I think infrastructure building, just like in cables, right? Back, uh, what was it, 25 years ago, if they didn't they'd build all the cable companies, yeah. broadband in the U.S. would be nowhere. Right, but um, there really kind of is an interesting point. You know, when we were hearing from Greg Brockman about the speed of development you know, in AI technology, uh, there's really a second question, which is the speed of deployment. You know, when you think about the internet and uh, you know how long you know the, the technology was now developed, yeah. you know, 50 years ago almost, and uh, you know it didn't really start to flower until 30 years ago, um, adopted widely, big bust, uh, and really we entered the the kind of era of internet being a little bit like electricity, you know, 30 years in. Yeah. So how do you forecast the adoption curves? And what drives that? And, 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 and you know, so leaving aside, you know, the fact that there's incredibly competitive entrepreneurs in China, mm. uh, you know, how does the ado the adoption rate go versus the U.S.? Well, the adoption rate, as slowed down by infrastructure, will be nil, mm. because in the case of electricity, you have to build the electricity grid. Uh, electrical grid. In the case of internet, you need the backbone and the high, high, high band uh, solutions. But in the case of AI, all these clouds are already there, and most of the solutions I talk about are purely software. Well, but there are a number. For example, ubiquitous uh, facial recognition, you know, such that you walk to your office and the door opens. Yeah. Uh, you know, that actually involves some hardware being installed. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, how long does it take for the market to do that versus is it uh, go faster? Uh, the idea of smart roads to, yeah. to go with smart cars yeah. uh, so that you basically have the road and the car meeting halfway uh, to make the problem simpler. Yeah. Very, very different kind of, yeah. of adoption dynamic than one in which That's right. uh, that we face here in the US. That's right. I think my point is that the infrastructure will be built quickly because it doesn't require building new roads or new cables. The applications can be quick if it's software only. Yeah. Uh, for example, and smart AI that replaces customer service agents. But if it requires replacing or doing hardware changes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, figuring out the traffic loss of autonomous vehicle, or building a robot that can work as a plumber, well, yeah. that can take a very long time. Well, and, and clearly, the, 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 you know, the progress of, of uh, cashless payments in China, mobile payments, is a, is a great example of how the internet infrastructure will be the carrier. You know, for, for credit cards, you need to have this massive distribution of credit card readers and so on, and, and, and all that just sort of uh, got bypassed. Yeah. And so there probably are other areas. Do you see anywhere that's already happening in yes. China? Yes, I think China has been behind in a few areas. China was behind in credit cards. Now leapfrog with mobile payment. Uh, Chinese retail has been quite a bit behind because e-commerce kind of uh, stifled growth in retail. But now smart retail that can be online plus offline and then using all these sensors to understand each individual's buying patterns, uh, I think retail could be a leap forward. Yeah. Chinese hospitals are way behind the US, but it's possible the large amount of data and some kind of automation tool could help them to catch up or leapfrog. Chinese schools are taught with a much larger student to teacher ratio, but you, we're now experimenting with remote teachers who are amazing teachers who can teach 800 at a time and using AI to do things like grading tests, grading homework, um, uh, uh, removing accents, and uh, do drills on math. Yeah. So the teacher's time can be uh, partially saved and then put more back into the one-on-one -on -one FaceTime. So I want to jump uh, to uh, this question uh, of human versus AI that uh, you described at the end of your talk, but also to get you to, to share with us uh, kind of a key turning point in your book. And, you know, all of you are here at an AI conference, so you probably all know about Nick Boston's paperclip maximizer, you know, the idea of the AI with the rogue optimization function 
uh, besides it's got to make paper clips and humans are in the way. Uh, and in a certain way, it's, it seemed to me that this hyper competitive uh, situation that you describe in China is itself a kind of example of a paperclip maximizer, where in our society uh, we are relentlessly optimizing for a certain kind of wealth, a certain kind of productivity, uh, to the exclusion of human life. When you, you talk about 996 as the, uh, you know, the model for how people work. And you had an experience that you talk about in the book that made you question that. Can you share that with us? Yeah, absolutely. I was uh, a super workaholic. I used to wake up at 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock every night uh, because I knew I had to check email. I was working for Google and Microsoft and in China, so I wanted to make sure my emails were current. Um, I used to work 996. I used to put work at priority for everything and leave little whatever time I had left for my family. But um, I was diagnosed four years ago, five years ago, with uh, fourth stage lymphoma. And that early diagnosis really didn't look promising. And when I felt I had maybe months to live, I suddenly reflected on my life as this self-optimizing paperclip. And it was um, uh, ridiculous how I lived my life. Um, and none of the things I optimized, I cared at all. Um, meant nothing to me. My work, success, money, fame meant nothing at all. The only thing I wanted to do was to spend more time with my family and uh, regret that I hadn't done that. So that was the moment when I came to realize for myself I need to change my ways. Uh, fortunately, um, my cancer is in remission, so I'm able to spend a lot more time with my family. Uh, when my kids come home, I drop everything from work. Uh, I, I focus on their vacation time, not my vacation time. My wife travels wherever we go. And, and I think that experience also comes into part of this book in thinking that maybe the solution to AI taking the routine jobs is that the routine jobs makes us all into these paper clips. And we need to take a step back and think where humanity put on earth to repetitively do all this work or is there something bigger to it? So that's why I ended with the conclusion that uh, we will one day thank AI for taking away the routine jobs and our workaholism and really let us think uh, why we live on this earth. I think that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. That let's uh, not be afraid of, of AI, let's use it, let the machines do all the work they can, and let us get on with the job of being human with each other. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.